It's been an exhausting last couple days. As a black man, it's kind of numbing to have to experience this over and over again. Just as much as an anomaly for her to hear that I've been pulled over 60 times, it was crazy for me to hear that she's never had interaction with police. I always hoped they could be alive to see that change because of everything they went through. It's true that this has been happening, but the difference is it's being filmed. So now they're listening. And I'm talking about even people that are so far right are having conversations and their eyes are open. Also kind of get the sense that there's a little bit of an awakening happening hoping that it's strong and it really kind of leads to some change. And it's this technology that in many ways allows us to sharpen the microscope on this issue of racism. What are the things you're afraid of that you don't want to ask or that we don't want to talk about? I see entrepreneurship more than just starting a business. I see it more as creators. We as entrepreneurs, especially tech entrepreneurs, have the privilege to be able to have our voices get carried that as much as we can do, we definitely need our allies. And to me, the way I see the whole thing, I see it with extreme optimism knowing that we've been fighting the same fight. How's it going, Unfound Nation? Dan Kihanya here, your host for Founders Unfound. Thank you so much for listening in. We've got a special episode today. We're changing up our normal format of great stories from founders of African descent. Instead, I've invited four black men who are entrepreneurs and former guests to have an honest and frank discussion about the historic recent events that are still unfolding as we record this. This is the first week of June, and 2020 is not even halfway done. We're dealing with a global health pandemic, which is infecting millions and killing hundreds of thousands. We have a decimated U.S. economy and 40 million Americans out of work. This has impacted African Americans particularly hard. We represent a higher percentage of COVID-19 cases and deaths, and certainly more than our appropriate share of both the unemployed and frontline workers. So it's with this as the backdrop that the killing of George Floyd last week has ignited protests around the country, calling for justice, social change, and an end to racial inequity, and really an end to the systemic racism that allowed for Mr. Floyd's tragic and senseless death. We want to first express our deepest condolences for Mr. Floyd's family, friends, and community. We pray for their healing, as well as for the cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul. Second, we want to say to everyone listening, find a way to get involved. Learn and listen. Speak up and donate. Participate. This is not an issue or challenge for any one community. This is a problem all of America must solve. We have some resources in the show notes if you need a place to start. Our episode is sponsored by Valence, a great new community for black professionals. We won't be running any ads in the episode, so be sure to check out the show notes for more info on the special offer Valence has for Founders Unfound listeners. Now, on with the special episode. Stay safe, everyone. So, hey, Unfound Nation, this is Dan Kihanya, your host for Founders Unfound. As many of us have experienced, this has been a tremendously impactful, sad, and also exhausting week for a lot of us. And to be a Black man in America, there's nobody immune from what's happening now. And so we decided to change up our regular schedule and our regular programming just to have a frank conversation. So I've brought on some of our former podcast guests who are all over the country and even in just over the border in Vancouver to talk about their feelings, how, they, how they're viewing things in, in, uh, in real time, how they feel as entrepreneurs, as black men, and what we think we can be doing, what we can be calling on others to do to address police brutality, racial inequality, and the things that have sparked the overwhelming protests that are going on right now. So we'll start off with having everybody introduce themselves. So why don't we start with you, Bara? Hello, everybody. I'm Bara Cola. I'm the founder and CEO of Carbice Corporation. We keep your electronics from overheating. And I'm a professor at the Georgia Institute of Technology in Material Science and Mechanical Engineering, based in Atlanta, Georgia. How are you doing? My name is AK or Coach AK. I'm out here in Boston. Uh, I'm a business strategist, uh, speaker, executive coach, and also the founder of Elite Styles. Hey, everybody. Khalil Ashante here. I'm an actor and a web developer, founder and CEO of WeShowUp.io, a digital pay-what-you-want solution for VR, online, and in-person events. And I'm in Vancouver, Canada, by way of Japan, by way of Germany. Hey, hey guys. My name is Claudius Memba, co-founder and CTO at New. We are a managed marketplace that connects vacation rental hosts, real estate agents, and commercial offices to cleaners who can clean. Um, we're based in Seattle, Washington. 
Thanks so much, gentlemen. And I really appreciate you taking the time. One of the interesting things about this week in particular has been just the the pull and tug, I think, that we're probably all feeling in terms of our own inner drive and, and motivation to be present and to be leaders, but also that for some reason, there's parts of the country that are awakening, people that are in our own circles who are saying, wow, can I talk to you about this? Or I've never really really understood this. And so I do appreciate you taking the time. I, I'm hopeful that um, the conversation is fruitful for you as well. So why don't we start off with just how do you feel today, which is, you know, Wednesday, June 3rd, that we're recording this, 2020. How does it feel today to be a Black man? Just a out here in Boston. You know, I did a, a post on this yesterday. And I've been receiving a lot of text messages, emails, and people that want to have a conversation as you're talking about that. And for me, for a while, I was feeling this situation was a little bit like a deja vu. Whereas like we've been here before, but it sounds and feels this time that it's different. People are are waking up. And, you know, when it, when it was happening beforehand, when an individual was, you know, black man was killed by the same individuals that are supposed to protect and serve, people would always find an excuse. Like, well, well was he resisting? Was something happening? But in this time, when they actually saw what was going on, I think it opened up their eyes to realize that like, we've been talking about this for a while. So now they're listening. And I'm talking about even people that are so far right are having conversations and their eyes are open. So I would say it actually feels good or better because people are now understanding our point of view. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with that. I think it's been somewhat validating, right? I mean, I think for all of us, well, I can speak for myself, all right? It, you know, you operate in, in several universes and it can be exhausting, right? To have to go back and forth and in some ways shield others who are not experiencing this directly, you know, as if to say, maybe if they don't feel that pain, they can appreciate it, which is, as I thought about it, kind of a weird, you know, sort of ironic thinking, why am I shielding people from this when it's, it's the stark reality of it and the visceralness of it that really affects them and, and can make them appreciate it more. I wanted to quickly chime in there and just echo some of the sentiments. I mean, it's definitely been, I'm sure people have been echoed this as well. It's been an exhausting last couple days, weeks. I think a lot of people question and, and have been really, really questioning the protests and rights. And I want to give some context to all this. I think people are quickly forgetting that we have been in a worldwide lockdown for the last three months. On top of that, black men still have to face racism and all that kind of stuff. And so that's where I feel like all, that's where all this is boiling from. A lot of the pent up rage from the lockdown and then coming into these senseless killings, quite frankly, it's been very just, yeah, as a black man, it's kind of numbing to have to experience this over and over again. As AK mentioned, it's deja vu. We've been here before. It's not new. But every time it happens, you ha you, you, it's weird because as humans, we kind of operate in this multiple, we have multiple emotions going on at the same time. You want to be mad. You want to speak out, but you also, are just numb to all all of it that's been happening. So it's like constant, yeah, it's just it's just a constant state of turmoil and, and it's exhausting. Quite frankly, I've been I feel like I've been sleeping more than I, I used to in the past is because I'm just so tired all the time. Mentally exhausted, physically tired. And, and again, all of that on top of being an entrepreneur. So it, it is it's definitely just really trying times. And to AK's point, I think I don't know what it is about 2020, but just a lot has been happening. Also kind of get the sense that there's a little bit of an awakening happening. I'm hoping that it's strong and it really kind of leads to some some change. But only time will tell where, where this takes us. I'm hoping that America can kind of come to realize the disparities, the racial, the racial inequality, the injustice that has really caused this angst, quite frankly. And we can all come to kind of reflect on that and make things better going forward. This is Khalil. I echo that sentiment. I don't I don't really have anything new to add to the conversation with that question. I, listening to those older than me, I lost both of my grandmothers in the last two years. And I just remember them prior to this with them saying, we've been here before, baby. You know, it's just that, man, I just, you know, I've always hoped they could see and be alive to see that change because of everything they went through. So we could sit here and have this conversation. But yeah, I just wanted to witness to what my brother there was, was talking about. So, so this is Barra, and I, I'll, I'll offer a, a different take because I, I agree with everything these guys just said, and I've had very similar emotions. Being a scientist and material scientist, I kind of look at things from a technology standpoint. And to me, the way I see the whole thing, I see it with extreme optimism, knowing that we've been fighting the same fight 
for hundreds of years. But if we take a moment and we step back and we look from early settler times to uh, the peak of slavery, the advancement of newspaper and mail delivery systems to spread news faster was an aid to the eventual overthrow of the slavery system. If you fast forward to the time of the civil rights, television and the ability to broadcast what was happening in the South to not only other parts of America, but to the world was a technological revolution that we effectively utilized to set ourselves just a bit freer. And now you fast forward to today and it's amazing because you hear people say that, and it's true that this has been happening, but the difference is it's being filmed. You would not be able to film that if everybody didn't have a phone in their pocket that had a camera, they could shoot movies. And it's this technology that in many ways allows us to sharpen the microscope on this issue of racism. And what I, you know, what I'm optimistic about when I think about it is that I, I think of the opportunity because we have been some of the greatest utilizers of technology to advance our freedom. And I see over the next hundred years of potential for us to be the ones who create it, who make the materials inside the next phone, the next sensor, the next thing that will help people to understand this issue even more. People talk a lot about big data. And, you know, one of the things that I was going to bring up that would be part of my suggested actions is that when we turn big data and AI onto this problem of racism in American society, we look at where companies put their manufacturing facilities, where investments from corporate and government entities are made and not made. And we put that information out in front of people, change is going to happen even more. So I'm optimistic. I'm tired because everybody is wanting to talk about it and I, and I want to be a part of that. But I'm energized from what I see and, and what I know is the connection between our progress as a whole country and the technological advancements we make. Great point, Bara. Uh, and maybe uh, just expounding upon that a little bit, if we all wear the hat, so to speak, of being entrepreneurs. How do you view your role in all of this as an entrepreneur, as a black man who is an entrepreneur? Is there something different or additional or is there a benefit or an additional challenge, really, to being an entrepreneur? I was just going to say it almost feels like an honor to be a symbol of empowerment for people who maybe grew up like we did or did not and see that it's possible. I feel like learning to code for my personal journey made me feel like some of the technological advances Barra was talking about. I understand them and understand how to harness them. And so all of the things that we already know about the lack of venture funding for people like us and all the, the different mountains we have to climb, I, I do feel like as an entrepreneur that there are a lot, there's, there's a lot of blue sky for us when we empower ourselves. Uh, to, to understand and to build and to take agency over our future as much as we can, given the circumstances. And also touch on that. This, if, if you were to talk to me on, you know, December 31st, 2019, as I'm making my, <laughs> you know, my, my New Year's resolutions, I would say where we are right now is almost like the twilight zone. You have COVID, you have protests, you have you know, and, and COVID even goes into a bigger situation. So even thinking about what's going on right now, we're still dealing with a COVID situation where all of a sudden we all had to become more digitalized in the work in which we do. You know, some of the work that I was doing, I was actually doing some work with Google and I was on my way to actually go on this international speaking tour. And two days before, I went out two days before I was actually on the plane, my whole schedule was, was canceled. What ended up happening, I think as an entrepreneur, what was the benefit is I see entrepreneurship more than just starting a business. I see it more as creators, meaning we don't need to be told to create something. We see a problem. We know how to put the people and the action steps in place. Now, how that helped, I think, business-wise is the ability to pivot, making that online. The second part is how I use it as you know entrepreneurship is how can we use our skill sets to solve a current problem? Right now, it's people are now aware and they're looking for some guidance. And I'm lucky that uh, some of the work I do is speaking. And, you know, my goal is how can I share the voice? How can I share the voice of others? Because people are asking questions there. I'm getting text messages on the day that like, how can I help? Let's have a conversation. So how can I use my voice or bring other people's voices like you're doing right now, Dan, to actually give people the perspective because people are listening. Just right before this call, I had a conversation with someone and... She was talking about, well, what's your experience with police officers? Because, well, I've probably been pulled over over like 60 times. And of those 60, 
20 of them were kind of in some hostile and 10 of those were straight up hands on hip. And I asked her, I was like, so how was it when you got pulled over? She's like, I've never been pulled over before. And I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Just as much as an anomaly for her to hear that I've been pulled over 60 times, it was crazy for me to hear that she's never had an interaction with police. And it just showed me about how people that live and maybe work in the same environment can have completely different experiences. And I think that's what they're now getting aware to. That's a great point, AK. I do see that the entrepreneurial skill set gifts, personality, attributes, whatever you want to call it, is very solution-oriented in all of what we do, all of us, we look at the world, we say there's a problem, there's a challenge, there's a there's a need that's unmet, and we deploy that in sort of an economic project called a startup, which is how do we find a solution that fits that need and fits it better than it's ever been fit, and in creating that value, build a business. But I do think those skills, the, that mentality can be aimed at social solutions, political solutions that ne are needed as well. And so I'm personally feeling a lot of obligation to try and turn my experience, my expertise into a machine that can help not just be an example and do well and thrive in my business, but how can I actually put those skills to work? Totally echo that. I was going to just build on what AK had mentioned here. To your question around what we as entrepreneurs can do and how we can leverage our platforms to impact the situation or this time, I recently wrote, written a blog post around how all of us have voices. And the gist of it was more or less that some voices are more amplified than others. We as entrepreneurs, especially tech entrepreneurs, have the privilege to be able to have our voices get carried, carried in these ecosystems that we operate in that are primarily white. And so what I'm doing, and I know what I'm doing in my, in my small bubble is just leveraging my voice to educate those around me about more around this situation. Again, a lot of people are, are wanting to listen now. I think this is definitely the time to really not be silent, but actually be, be out there, be speaking and helping others come to an understanding or at least come to, to be empathetic to the situation and, and what has caused all this. Again, we're very fortunate as entrepreneurs to be able to have the ears of our ecosystem, those in the ecosystem, whether it's those in venture capital or other fellow entrepreneurs, to be able to then leverage that. But I think what my blog post and what kind of I was getting to alluding to in that was more around that as much as we can do, we definitely need our allies, those who are who have more of a platform than we do, largely the white males in these ecosystems who have a, a larger platform whose voices carry even more to be able to speak on our behalf and carry our message forward so that others can see it as well. Because Richard Sherman had recently put out a, a statement uh, stating that he was very happy to see other white football players carrying the flag as well, because for some people... It coming from a black athlete, it doesn't resonate as much as it coming from someone of their of their race. And so it's the same here. And I'm glad to see that others are are really stopping the silence and, and getting in the field and getting in the game and, and being proactive and really speaking. I agree that, you know, we building and using our voice, what however that voice needs to come out is absolutely what needs to happen. And I if I may wanted to ask my brothers and, and uh, you know all of us on the podcast, when it comes to that voice, when people approach you asking how they can use their voice, have have any of you encountered that? And what was your what was your approach? That that's something that's been asked of me that I wasn't quite sure how to handle. I just wanted to see if I could gain some wisdom from all of you. You know, one one of the biggest lessons I learned as an entrepreneur is in the process of getting tenure at Georgia Tech. You know, when you start off as a faculty member, a lot of times people say, hey, don't do all this outreach stuff. Focus on your research and get tenure and then help people after that. And they have good reasons for saying that. But one of the things that I found, which ended up being kind of opposite of the common advice, is that if I found ways to weave social activism and consciousness into the fabric of what I do fundamentally in my research in a way where it's not stretching me, but it's a mutual learning experience. Not only was I able to do it efficiently because it was holistically a part of my life, I became excellent and I won awards and I did everything and I exceeded. And so when I built Carbice, one of the things I thought about up front was, I mean, we sell materials. We sell something that looks like black, dirty aluminum foil that goes into your computer and nobody ever sees it. I mean, there's no social justice mission that you really naturally would think you wrap around that. But I think what entrepreneurs are we have control over. And that's kind of what fuels us a lot of times when I go out and execute. 
building culture at Carbice, we really were intentional about focusing on values and things that we felt drove good business, but also drove us to be good citizens. And I, and I think in, in thinking about it that way, I felt very well prepared for this situation. And that if I decided to pin an article like I did yesterday, that it fit seamlessly into the culture that I was building in my company. And so that's kind of the advice that I tell people in general is that if you want to have a voice, find a way to make it authentic and to use your experiences to speak through the things that are passionate for you and that what you are interested in. Plus one to that. And actually was something I wanted to call out earlier because I'm glad you brought it up, Khalil. It's definitely one of those situations where I think a lot of people fully assume, and Dan, you alluded to this as well in mentioning that you've written your blog post on this topic, what, eight times now and, and still haven't found the courage to push that out the way you yeah. want it. Yeah. A lot of people assume that Black people have the answer in, in this situation or can, or that, that the situation isn't as uncertain for us too. But all those points allude to the fact that both Dan's comment and Khalil, the fact that we too face the same problem in the sense that it is a touchy subject. No one knows what exactly is right to say, and we're all trying to figure that out. But my advice has always been, one, speak to Vara's point, speak on your experiences, and no one can ever discount your experiences. So that's that's the one thing. Speak on your experiences and trust your gut in terms of speaking to speaking to that. As long as you're doing those two things, whatever statement you're making, you can know it's factually accurate. You can know that no one can call you out on it. No one can try to undercut your statement. No one can try to take that away from you. So I had a a friend recently reach out to me who was a business owner in in Seattle who recently had their place almost ransacked, et cetera. And we were just discussing that. And I brought up the same fact that like, hey, I'm, he was discussing not knowing how to, how to more or less what to say. He felt, he felt kind of hamstrung. And I was like, well, I'm in the same place. It's it's not any, any different on this side. I have to also be conscious about what I'm saying. And it's not like I have all the answers. So you coming to me, we had a great discussion. I love the the discourse, but I was open to letting him know like, hey, I'm in the same place. It's not like I have the answers. I can't give you all those answers. All yeah. I can do is speak on my experiences and tell you how I've experienced it and what I think you should do. But that's just, again, my experience. So if any, it, hopefully that was kind of helpful, but that's, that's something I definitely wanted to touch on. The fact that people think Black people have all the answers around this topic. It's, it's not true. We're also dealing with the same same issues in terms of knowing how to how to best approach it. Yeah. And just the people on this call, you can see, I mean, you know, there's not one answer, right? And there's not one stage of insight or preparation or contemplation that we've all done. And so it is a hard thing. And when people come to me, you know, I've tried to be open. And as you said, Claudius, it's about sort of sharing my experiences not trying to generalize for anybody, and also being very aware that I have several sets of things that are privilege enabling for me that other Black men and certainly other Black entrepreneurs don't have. And being conscious of that and being able to explain that I that I appreciate those privileges, but I also wear them as a responsibility to try and help and to try and bring others along. And Barra talked about values. I mean, I think that's you you got to go back to what your values are and use that as the sort of foundation. And, you know, I also agree that being authentic is really what, what is key. And I know for me, I'm, I'm turning a point. Like I, like I think I said earlier, it's like I felt like I've been isolating some of my non-Black friends from what, what life is like. And I think I'm going to let down that that veneer because that's not serving them. It doesn't serve the people who have the harsh realities that I don't have to deal with all the time, who have to deal with it every single day, every minute of the day, as soon as they walk outside of their house. So great, great question, Khalil. Thanks so much for for asking that. Yeah, I want to build on what you're just saying as well, Dan, in two ways. One of them is, is you know, I'm, I'm lucky I'm a former professional athlete and I've traveled around the world doing a lot of different things. But when I walk outside, I don't have that credential around my neck. People still see me the same. And it actually shouldn't matter if I have those or not. And what they don't realize, especially when they're talking about some of these celebrities or athletes that are speaking up about it, what they're doing is similarly what people are coming to us about asking us, like, what should we do or give us some answers and some questions. So the same thing that there were some individuals may have saying, like, well, they have the platform, they're successful. Why are they, you know, why are they adding their two cents to this? It's, it's similar to what you're seeing right now. You don't realize that people right next to you. And as you said, I haven't been sharing it. I don't give that. You don't realize that people really right next to you that are working at the same place, living in the same city might have different experiences. And, you know, as we look at even potentially, you know, moving forward, you know, when I was thinking about even this, 
the, the video that we saw of the, the officer, we sometimes always look at it as produced police brutality. And what we don't see is around that, around that police vehicle, there are two other people that were holding his body down. And I see that in some ways as a system. So it's not only just the person that's putting the knee on the back of the neck, but sometimes it's these systems that we are part of. And some things that people can do is this may change the way that we now begin to hire or the companies we begin to fund when you realize and you understand these stories. So we can all do something. People can do something. It's not just about police brutality. It's the system that we can now address. And people in their jobs, people in their positions of power that may have overlooked somebody because of you know, their backgrounds may have a second look and realize that they can do something each and every day. That's a great point, AK. Great point. So maybe th- let's dovetail that into the conversation of now, and we've already alluded to it, several of you have already brought it up. I think we're all chomping at the bit, to so to speak. But what what do we do? What What is the action? What is the recommendations that we have for ourselves and for others like us to move the, the needle here? And to move the ball forward, whatever metaphor or analogy you want to use, so that we're not talking about this in 2021 or in 2022 or in 2023. What is it we can do? You know, I I grew up right down the street from a trailer park and the projects. You get those interesting demographics in Pensacola, Florida. But what I know about the police is that that they go into the trailer park and they, they may beat up the white people there. And then they go down and shoot people in the black part. But now they're one of those is a good outcome. But then you go to these neighborhoods like the one I live in right now in Atlanta, in Men Park, where people have money and the police are sitting there holding the door for you. So, I mean, I think that it's just the community, the economics of the community is such an important thing to focus on. And I feel like that one, we're completely blind to the reality of how the economics of the counties across this country are set up and support it, which means there's no accountability structure to for corporations in the government for the choices that they're making that drives that disparity. And I, and I think as a first step, we need to just be aware of that and figure out a way to create visibility, just like the cell phone camera creates visibility of the police officer putting his neck, his, his, his uh, knee on, on George Floyd's neck and killing him. We need to create visibility of the systemic racism and the economic injustice that has lingered in society for some time. Would echo all of that and just like to build on that. Well, one, Dan mentioned, yeah, we don't have a definite answer. One thing that I've been doing in this time is really just reading up, learning, educating myself more on, obviously, I've been sharing things to just people in my network, uh, educating themselves on, on the Black experience and racism, et cetera. But I've been reading up on politics and the money that's going behind it. Um, we, this could be a whole different conversation. But one thing I do want to call out is, is that racism and photography are kind of intertwined. There's an ad that you mentioned around kind of the districting and how how certain areas are funded, et cetera. That all comes from politicians. That all comes from the top. Sadly, a lot of our politicians are being bought out by corporations and entities and billionaires who have the funds to be able to launder that money and hide it in, in, in a sense. So I agree the, the transparency has got to be first and foremost. Um, and I think that comes from the lawmakers. We need to elect leaders who create laws that provide the people with transparency as to who is doing what, who's funding what, et cetera, so that we can all kind of see the, that audit trail of how these decisions are made. There's there's certain laws that we all look at and like, how did this get passed? Like, why did this like why did this even make it through? And we don't realize that there's a lot of money coming through pushing behind why it's get why it should get passed. And so I think there definitely needs to be a lot of transparency uh, at that level. And then also just a lot of accountability from our elected leaders. Quite frankly, a lot of them are jumping at the at the role to quote unquote lead the people only to get only to sell out and, and take money from others and then essentially throw away their conscious and their morality in helping the greater good. And then that's why I, I fight so hard to like know what to do because it's it's a huge there's this is a big system. We're we're fighting against a huge system and there's a lot of points that need to be changed for things to really change and for the for for the tide to turn. But I'm just hopeful that people are educating themselves and reading things. Uh one book I recommend is called Dark Money by Jane Mayer. Definitely recommend reading that book. Um, educates you on kind of the political system and how things are being bought out, how people are being bought out, politicians, et cetera. And those are the guys creating the laws that are essentially keeping racism and systemic racism in place. And I think that's where it needs to start. That's where the change needs to start from. Unfortunately, I don't know how we're going to be able to do that other than people becoming more aware of it. Yeah, that's that's actually a really good approach, man, because I, I was, as as you mentioned that, I remember my, my time in the U.S. Air Force, I was sort of mentored by 
an older brother from um, a Rocky Mountain, North Carolina. And he made sure that I read a book called The Miseducation of the Negro, uh, originally published by Dr. Woodson in 1933. And that, and I guess for me, as I think about what I can do, so I have three boys who are mixed race, and it's going to be easier for them to grow up in Vancouver than it is in Seattle or Chicago. And so maybe sort of, you know, for me, I guess my answer, what can we do is to, you know, for me is to make sure that I'm up on some of the things you were talking about, you know, whether it be the political system, how things move, but also making sure that those around me are educated and that they are exposed to this and that they understand that they, you know, your kids can only understand so much until they experience it, but just to make sure that they're not shielded from it. And I find myself I wouldn't say getting in arguments with other parents, but I do believe that there are a lot of parents out there who think their kids are too young to learn about these kinds of issues. And I feel like that's a very, yeah, look, we're only going to be around for, for so long. And the next generation is who's going to have to carry this torch. And if they're growing up being sheltered because their parents don't think they're old enough to talk about it, we're just going to end up right back here in 2032. So I do feel like that education for me and the education for my kids is something that I, I, I need to make more of a priority. Great point. I I think for me, I I look at it as, you know, I kind of look at it as different uh, trajectories. One is the personal level. So I talked about like how I'm going to try to be more open and authentic with the people inside my circle. I, I, because of the, like Claudia said, because of the ecosystems we plug into, there are many people who don't have any sense of this at all and probably look at me differently than George Floyd. And I need them to understand that I can be George Floyd. And just like AK said, when I walk out the door, my resume is not taped to my back. My character is not on display as some coat that I can wear or we say, oh, well, he's good. He's fine. Right. Yeah. My, my skin is my skin. And so so helping them understand that. But I also think there is this uh, ability for us to to look into the deeper sense of transparency and accountability with politicians. I looked up the other day, for instance, just the New York police pension fund has $44 billion in it. And um, that covers, I think, something like 80,000 active and retired police officers. And as a businessman, I know that fund is right now in Fidelity and Goldman and and BlackRock and all these uh, fund managers. They're making fees. And if there was uh, a call for accountability, for instance that those funds could only be custodial for police pensions that have a certain amount of covenants around misconduct. And, you know, clearly you were in the military. There's a very clear line of discharge. You're honorable, you're dishonorable. And if you're dishonorable, yeah. you get nothing. And you you can't be in the military again. Right now, police officers can fade away and show up at another, another county, another city uh, without any repair to their propensity to bad behavior right and so i think i think there's a lot of accountability transparency that we have to start demanding you know for me i think uh, and, and we've all brought this up it can't just be us and people that look like us and i think that's why you see people's rage taking on the extreme measures cuz you know you scream enough when nobody listens you start hitting and throwing and breaking things which I don't advocate. I'm not a violent person and I don't, but I can totally understand how that gets frustrating. Uh, I'll, I'll touch on that as well. As I just got off the phone, the person I was talking to, she was talking about how she feels a sense of shame a little bit. And I think the shame is because when you've been talking about something for so long and then all of a sudden you become real, it doesn't mean the ones that the conversations beforehand didn't happen. It means that she's now aware that, like, oh my goodness, all those other times you were talking about this, I just didn't pay attention to it. And where we are right now, it is if, if they don't see us or they don't understand that when we bring up issues, they're not going to be on board. But I feel like right now is they're now no longer just passerbyers and onlookers, they're now a part of it. And now they're waiting, like, give us some orders, give us some direction. And, you know, one of the things I think is really good is social media with technological advances, but I also see that there's a little bit of some negative or some challenges with it. Right within within the civil rights movement, they had television, but there could be one individual, one small group that says, "This is what we want to do, and this is what we don't want to do." This aligns with our vision. This doesn't align. But when you have social media, when everybody has a voice, it's like there's so many different directions they can go. So if we were to say, "What well, we want everybody to do, we want everybody to go to the polls, or we want everybody to come on this bill to make it mandatory for 
police officers to have body cameras and if they don't, it throws out the case. So I think people are on board. They're aware. They're awakened. I think they're just thinking about, okay, well, now where do I use this energy after the protests? Where do I do? What can I do on a daily basis? Because I'm ready to do something. And the only thing I feel like they think they can do is, well, I have a friend that is a black male. Maybe I can help him out. But I think they're trying to find something to do. They just need some type of clear direction. I, I want to add on to that, AK, because I mean, you, you are a true entrepreneur. Because what I feel like you did is you identified a business opportunity. One way, and so there are problems with social media, just like you identified. But I think that that's the next company that somebody needs to start. Maybe they have already started it. <laughs> are you listening, Unfound Nation? This is your call. We've all got businesses already. So that's just an opportunity for somebody. <laughs> This is this is great. So I know everybody's busy. So I just want to end with maybe just people's final thoughts. And, you know, I would just frame it as if you're sitting across the table from somebody who, who says they want to be helpful, they want to understand, what, what would you say? How would you make them feel like you want them to help and that you can give them sort of that call to action? I'll jump in here first. I guess I would just, I would start by thanking them for taking the courage to 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 reach out. Like again, we know it's not easy. This is not comfortable times. It's very uncomfortable. And people having that courage to go do the hard thing, which is not sit silently and, and kind of just ogle, but to actually take a step and reach out to someone affected or a community and say, hey, I'm, I'm here. I'm committed to change. How can I help? That's the first thing. And that's a hard thing. And we understand that, taking that first step. And so I would just start by thanking them. And then secondly, I would start by sharing them resources in which they can educate themselves on the perspective of Black males, Black people in America. There's tons of books, documentaries, movies, anything you want. There's there's something out there for you to go educate yourself on just the experience of, of being Black. And we can't have change without education. People who aren't able to see other experiences and empathize with them will never be able to, yeah, will never be able to empathize with it. And so I think it starts there. Um, that would be my, that would be my approach in my discourse and, and then obviously follow up with them just to make sure that we can have a discussion, keep the door open, whatever they're learning. If they have any questions, they can come back and ask me and I can provide my perspective and my experience on it. Yeah, I, w- I would say something similar even, you know, to what Claudius was talking about is in the follow up. Because how many times do we have initial conversations? It almost becomes that sort of classic, hey, you know what, man, we need to get together and then you never get together. So when they do approach you, that, that thanks and that gratitude, but then making sure that we have other conversations about this. And one of the things I wanted to throw out there is maybe the unpopular opinion of embracing the difficult parts of the conversation. What are the things you're afraid of that you don't want to ask or that we don't want to talk about or that you think might be out of bounds? Because it's in the unreconciled parts of our stories that we find those opportunities. And that's usually where most of the growth is. And, you know, I'm a big, big proponent of growth and discomfort go hand in hand. And uh, look at the growing pains our country is going through. And I feel like, you know, being able to build that trust with people who do approach us and letting them know that they're safe and that they're they're witness to can lead to those follow up conversations, which will hopefully go a little bit deeper and and create a little bit more understanding. I'll add on to that, that I, I would really challenge them to embrace that difficulty as well, because what I would say is that when when you respond to the the trending nature of posting things on social media and then immediately wanting to make donations to charities that you feel like are fighting uh, this battle. And you do that without understanding the issue. You do that without having a deep appreciation for the root cause. You may miss the mark. And if you miss the mark, you're already going to feel good about yourself that you did something you're going to move on potentially. So I, I would ask people to get uncomfortable with that and say, let's not get caught up in the moment where we just want to send a hundred, a thousand or whatever to a charity. We want to post something and move on. Let's go read a book. Let's go more research and try to really ask yourself the hard question. What is the root cause of this problem? And you may not get to it, but at least spend some time struggling with that and then take an action. I found this question a a little tough because... I think the storytelling of sharing stories needs to happen both. Ways. And, you know, you know, for example, I use this example of I'm six foot three, 220 pounds. I'm a big guy. And, you know, when I go into to get to my car at night, I don't worry about being sexually assaulted, but maybe females do. And, and the reason why I bring that up is, is because their lifestyle or maybe their experiences have never actually 
they would never understand it because they've never experienced it. They wouldn't know what it feels like to be pulled over several times. And they shouldn't. I mean, that shouldn't be like the, and I always talk about, for me, it's really important that it's not a, always about like a privilege. It's like, this is a, a basic human right. It's a basic human. Like we should be able to go to our car safely. We should be able to apply for a job. And because we have a certain type of name, it's now thrown into the waste. You know, we, we need to set this line that's like, this is what all humans should be able to do, no matter how you look like. And our goal should also be an understanding them and un- understanding each other. Because I feel like it comes only one side listening um, and only one side talking. It's only going to go so far. I think it's for us to understand one another and then find solutions together. Both sides need to have conversation, understands the point of view. You know, some, I think some, some families do maybe don't, don't, don't look like this, maybe grew up in environments that weren't, that may have been racist, but some people just grew up on a different side of the street where they never had to go on the opposite side. So my full, in one sentence, I guess I'll say is what I will do is say, this is just the start. It's not, it's not trying to just find a solution. It's your eyes have now been opened. Now you can start listening when situations do arise. So you see a report come out and it said this guy was a risk resisting or he had drugs and maybe like, ah, I'm going to question that just a little bit. So I think it's about how do we keep the eyes open and not go back into that passerby blinded look because more things will happen. It's not just today. More things will happen. How can we get them on board and understanding like we question that situation? There's something that's not right here. And now they're on our side long term and not just in the short term. No, that was great. That was great. Wow. These are great suggestions. And I put you all on the spot. And what I hear is this idea of the two way street. I think definitely you know, I would love to start the hashtag, I practice civil discourse. Now, I know that rage ha- has its place, but but there's so much of us talking past each other. And, you know, as the old saying goes, right, God gave us two ears and one mouth. Um, then that's the proportion of our listening to talking. But I do think there's also this option or this opportunity to challenge people around, are you learning? Are you educating yourself, right? And that, I think, goes both ways. There's sort of all kinds of resources to research. And I think also the connecting, right? I think hopefully if that person's sitting across from me, that we have at least a level of intimacy in our relationship for them to ask candid questions. And I would say, if you don't have more people like that in your network, not tomorrow, because you know that's not the appropriate time during the middle of this, but at some point, make it intentional, right? Those acquaintances, you know, pursue them as potential people who could be deep relationships. And so this, like, AK is saying the stories that you can hear and feel from somebody who is your friend and who is somebody you're close with will resonate just as much as what you see in social media or on the news and sometimes more. And I also think that this idea of investing and acting is going to need to be the the follow on, right? It can't just be, okay, now I'm educating myself and oh, that's too bad, right? It's got to be, okay, this is an American problem. It's not a black community problem. It's not a problem for black men. Uh, we, We are the manifestations of it, but this is an American problem. We are all Americans. And if any Americans are suffering from injustice or um, in, inequality or have to ask for or demand rights that are already sort of given to us the day we're born or the day we're, we become citizens, that's a problem for America. Thanks for hosting this and, and really putting this call out there. I appreciate everybody's perspective. It's been awesome. All right. Well, stay safe, everybody. We'd like to thank our guests, Khalil Ashanti, Barakola, A.K. Eekwalker, and Claudia Mbemba, as well as our sponsor, Valence. Subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts, or simply go to foundersunfound.com forward slash listen to. That's listen, T-O. And follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Founders Unfound. This podcast was produced by Dan Kihanya, social media and other promotion by Umama Marzouk. Our music was composed by James Grant and Bruce Zimmerman. I am Dan Kihanya, and you've been listening to Founders Unfound.